Hello, my dear friends. How are you doing today? I want to talk about the abomination of desolation, which was a topic that came up um, from the comments that I got. And so I think I need to really um, uh, uh, clarify uh, that concept or that event that happened because there's so many false assumptions around that event. Um, I also uh, just recently was uh, involved in a conversation on Facebook about that topic. And of course, the problem that arises constantly is this belief or this assumption, and it is an assumption, and I will show that today why it is an assumption. It's part of actually explaining what the abomination of desolation is. The assumption is that there's actually a connection between the abomination of desolation and the man of sin sitting in the temple of God. Now we find this statement, the man of sin sitting in the temple of God, of course, in 2 Thessalonians 2. It was made by Paul, okay? He's saying before the, um, uh, before the day of the Lord comes or before the saints are taken out, before the transformation or the resurrection um, rapture happens, the Antichrist, or he doesn't use the word Antichrist, he uses the man of sin. Okay, I've said so many times, it's very, uh, you know, tricky to use that word. I use it sometimes just because I know people kind of have a concept of what Antichrist is, and I use it. But it's really not biblical. And Paul used the word man of sin. And he describes him as the person that does what he pleases. Okay. The man that does what he pleases. And Paul obviously got that information. Yeah, the man what he does what he pleases from Daniel 11. And we're going to go there because that will show us that there's really no connection between this man of sin and this abomination of desolation. And then I will explain what this abomination of desolation really is okay so i think it's a good thing to just go to i have daniel 11 up right now but i'm gonna go up and look at second thessalonians first actually you can no let's let's go there because it's good to read it again i mean many people uh, know it but, um, you know, we quote so many things that are really not in the Bible and we have no understand, really. We should always go to the Bible, read it, see it in context. And here it says concerning, and that's in Second uh, Thessalonians 2, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so his return. He comes and returns to the bride first. In my last video, I showed you that very clearly. Well, the Bible showed you that clearly because I'm always showing Bible verses. Okay, where did that tell you that? And I even mentioned 2 Thessalonians 2. No, I think I, think I mes uh, mentioned 1 Thessalonians 4. But anyways, here we are, 2 Thessalonians 2. Two, which talks about the same event that First Thessalonians 4 and 5 talks about. It's the returning, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's about the 20, it's about Matthew 25 and the 10 virgins. Okay? It's the returning of Jesus. And it's not just one day. It happens a long period of time, the appearing of Jesus. First, he picks up his bride 
Then there's the wrath of God where he destroys all his enemies. Then is his ruling. That's, it's, you know, a step-by-step -step, uh, events. But so this is what he's talking about. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. Okay? Now this is not the gathering that the, the angels are doing. This is the gathering that Jesus is doing. He himself personally is coming to pick up his bride. Okay? We ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching already from us, whether by a prophecy or by a word of mouth or by a letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Okay? They were afraid that the day of the Lord had already come. That's the same thing as the coming of the Lord Jesus. That's the day of the Lord. At the end of the times of the Gentiles, the church is taken out and the day of the Lord starts. The day of the Lord is a thousand years, not one day. Okay? Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. And we are in verse 3. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Okay? This is what we're talking about. This is the thing that we're talking about here okay so this man of sin or man of lawlessness needs to be revealed there needs to be a rebellion first okay a falling away sometimes it's translated as a falling away a falling away from the faith people make no mistake we are not living uh, in, in isolation. 2,000 years ago, there was already a rebellion and a falling away. Or else this man of sin could have not come to uh, power. And this man of sin has come to power already. And I'm not going into detail about that. I have talked about that. It's, it's kind of, you know what? There's a lengthy study about this. So I'm not going into detail. But this man of lawlessness is revealed the man doomed to destruction. Okay? He opposes himself about, about everything that is called God or is worshipped as God. He makes himself God. Okay? And by making himself God, he's putting himself in the temple of God. Now, what does Paul see if people do not know Paul's teachings, they can be misled here. What do you think t uh, uh, Paul teaches about the temple of God? He clearly teaches no place does Paul ever say that there's going to be a third physical temple. He always says the temple of God is either the individual person or the church. That's the temple of God with Jesus Christ on top. So we are the temple of God. We are the individual stones of the temple. Okay? Now, people do not understand that. Many people. But I think they're just really false teachers. And they're just really either horribly deceived or just are deceivers themselves. Okay? Maybe they're deceivers themselves. That's very possible. But these people, they don't understand this concept that we are the body. Each person is a stone in their temple. Okay? That's what Jesus is doing right now. He's building the true temple of God. And I have done videos about that. So I'm not going into detail. So he sits himself into this temple of God and proclaims that he's the head of the church. That has happened. Okay? The Roman Catholic Church, the Pope, did that. Starting with the emperors. 
Constantine, the first one that put himself into the church and proclaimed himself God and head of the church. He kicked out Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Okay? So only that much. But anyways, this is what um, they are talking about. Exactly that. The man of lawlessness and um, the man doomed to destruction. So where did Paul get this idea? Because we can never go by just this. This is not telling us everything. It's telling us that a timeline of the end. He's saying before the day of the Lord happens, before the Lord returns, the Antichrist will come to power. That's all. Now, remember, we have 2,000 years, and this is during the time of Paul. Okay? I don't know when he wrote it. 60, 60 AD. So, anyways, um, I'm just looking at my thing. It says SIM card. I don't need a SIM card. Anyway, I'm looking at my camera here. So, anyways, um, so this is this man of sin. And he got this idea about the man of sin from Daniel. Okay? We Oh, that's what I was uh, said. We can never see these things in isolation. We need to see it in connection with other parts of the Bible. Because God always gives us um, two witnesses, at least two witnesses. I've been saying that almost in every one of my videos. So now we're going to go to... Let's see. We're going to go to Daniel 11, where we see this man of sin described by Daniel, because that's where Paul got this idea from. He didn't just get this idea on his own. Okay. Like I said, there's always two witnesses. So now we're going to Daniel 36, Daniel 36, I and mean, then Daniel, Daniel 11, 36. And that's where this man of sin is described. Okay, he is called the king will do as he pleases. And you can continue. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. Okay? That is exactly that person. You can continue to read it. Okay? And he is he will rule. It's not one king. So many people, they, they say, oh, king, and then they're assuming it is uh, just one ruler. No, king, and if you look in the, in the original text, it, it, it could even tell you that, but they translate it as king, okay? No, this is a ruler. It's a, it's a series of the rulers. It's actually more like a kingdom, okay? A kingdom. Then a king, then one, one king. It's a kingdom. It's the little horn of Daniel seven. Okay, go back to Daniel seven. The beast, the fourth beast, had this little horn in the middle. That's him. Okay, so go back to Daniel seven and read that definition. Same definition. I will stay with this one. Because I will show you clearly that this king or kingdom has actually nothing to do with the destruction of the temple or the abomination of desolation. Okay? Emphasis on desolation. So here we have the king in verse 36. It does as he pleases. Again, it's the little horn. And in Daniel 7, we see exactly it is a kingdom. Horns are kingdoms. Okay, so this is a series of kings or rulers that come and do these exactly these things. Then in 40, at the time of the end, the king of the south, so that is at the end, that is close to where we are right now. Matter of fact, that is most likely before, well, no, I know it's before. 
So at the end, the king of the south will engage him in a battle. And the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. Okay? So he will be attacked by the king from the south and the north. I personally believe, it doesn't say that here, the king of the south is the Ottoman Empire. Okay? They try to destroy his kingdom, the Catholic Church, the Vatican, the Vatican's rule, because that's what it is. Okay? That's the king of the south, I believe, is the Ottoman Empire, who almost took over Europe and ended up in front or before um, Vienna, was de defeated. By Turkin Louis. Turkin Louis. I know Turkin Louis because Turkin Louis is actually from the region that I am from. So that's why I know the history about who defeated this Ottoman Empire. Oh, he was part of it. So, anyways, then the the, the other one from the north that comes against him. So north of Vatican was Napoleon, and he tried to destroy him too. He actually did take him out of, of, of office. Okay, so here we are talking about this is the end right now. And, you know, we are almost at the end of the chapter. So here this is the end, but the end is not near yet when Napoleon took over in 1700. His story will continue. Okay, this, this man, uh, this king who will do as he pleases will continue to reign all the way to the end. He's still here right now. But what I'm trying to say with this one right here, okay, Daniel 11 is a chronological historical account of the kings starting from Darius the Mede. From Daniel's time, 500 years before Jesus. My battery is going jet there. Time. So again, this timeline starts with Darius the Mede and goes all the way to the end. So you're going to have to look how these, um, and it's only what, 40 some verses, 45 verses verses okay that describe the whole history of 2500 years so you know each verse or section has really a whole i mean starting with 36 um, to the end is almost 2000 years when was when did constantine establish the roman catholic church 300 okay Let's say the Roman Catholic Church, the popes finally, you know, got in 500. So 1,500 years of a time span, starting with verse 36. Okay? Now, we don't see anything about this guy setting himself into any temple. Now, would you think that's where they're going to tell you that this guy is actually setting himself into a temple? Now, I know Paul said it, okay, Paul said it, but Paul, what does he talk about? Temple. Daniel didn't know the same thing that Paul knew about what the temple of God really is. So he didn't bring that up. But Paul was talking about the temple of God, the true temple of God that Messiah will establish. But what I'm trying to show here is this is the timeline of this king that Paul was talking about. Nothing about the abomination of desolation. But where do we hear in this timeline about the abomination of desolation? In verse 31. Okay, 31. That's a long time 
before this king even comes on the scene. This king was not even alive at that time. Now the empire, the beast, on which this horn would come out, was in existence. That was the Roman Empire. We see that from Daniel 9. So now this verse 31 says, before, long before, his armed forces will rise up to des desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. Okay? With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist. This is talking about the destruction of the temple. Desolation. Now, if you keep thinking somebody is sitting in the temple, this is not what desolation is. This has nothing to do with anybody sitting in the temple. He is not saying, oh, by the way, somebody is sitting in the temple or anybody is sitting in the temple. No, it's a desolation. Now, a desolation is a destruction. Okay? He says here he will set up the abomination of desolation that causes desolation. Okay? He will set up. And I really think that's a wrong translation. And I'm not going to anybody else's translation. You can do that study yourself. Okay? He's not setting up the abomination. I bet, I bet King James says it differently. Okay? Okay? No, he causes, he's causing the abomination of desolation. He's causing the destruction of the temple. Okay, he's saying he desecrates the temple fortress, which is, of course, the temple, the temple mound, and will abolish the daily sacrifice, even though really the daily sacrifice was abolished before. There's a really good book that I will put on the bottom. Um, it's an older book, little teeny book, that ta talks about the destruction of the temple. I have done so many videos about it. So many. But it's good to do it again because I have new subscribers. So here's the daily, abolishing the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. Okay? The temple mound was burned. The burning actually started by their own people, okay? By the rebellion, the Jewish rebellion that rebelled against the, uh, the, the troops there in Jerusalem. Actually, Titus, which became emperor. He was, I think, the leading officer. So... The destruction of the temple is right here. This is what it is. Abomination of desolation is the destruction of the temple. Nothing about anybody sitting in the temple. Way years before this king who does what he pleases um, or this man of lawlessness comes into power. Way before. my, You need to use your logical thinking as well. I believe if you do not want to use your logical thinking, then why are you even bothering with studying this difficult uh, topic? Okay? I understand people follow these false teachings. I have done it. And I have said it causes your eyes to sh be shut, your thinking to be shut. And it is very difficult to come out is, uh, of these preconceived ideas once they're in there it's almost like it's hard to get rid of them okay it, it really takes i mean the holy spirit to change your mind and to open your eyes to the nonsense you're believing it's nonsense why because they're using certain verses in order for you to be confused this is obvious what the real timeline is. Now, if we're going now 
to Daniel 9, which so many people use to say, oh, the man of sin is sitting in the temple, and that's the abomination. No, people. It's not what it says, and I have explained that over and over again, and I can put it again on the bottom if you want me to. Um, you know, if you're still not convinced, we're going to the 70th week. The 70th week is the biggest lie of dispensationalism. Okay? Do not believe it, because that's what it says. Okay? 24. It says, 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression. Yes, it is for the people, but it is also to finish or mainly to finish, the, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint. Here in my translation, says the most holy place. No. Anoint the most holy one. Okay? Anoint the most holy one. That's, that's totally misleading. And the original text tells you that. And they translated it with place. So they can mislead you. To anoint the most holy one. Who is the most holy one? It's Jesus. He was anointed by what he did on the cross. And that finishes the 70 weeks. Okay? See, people don't read this introduction. They go to verse 26 and let themselves be totally deceived by these false teachers that are saying, oh, the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. It says the people, not the ruler. The ruler is going to come in the future. That's what we, are, we saw exactly in Daniel 11. The ruler who is to come. Yeah, years later. Will destroy the city and the sanctuary. You understand that? The people of the ruler who will come. Who is going to destroy the city and the sanctuary? City and the sanctuary. That's Jerusalem. That's what it's talking about, the destruction of Jerusalem. And the temple, the sanctuary. That's what people call the abomination of desolation. Okay? And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is degreed is put, poured out on him. This is a false translation. I, I don't really, I probably should be going now to the new, uh, new King James Version because he really does a bad job translating. And if you're not understanding the King James right there, yeah, it's mis very misleading. Very, very misleading. Very misleading. If you don't understand it. But the ruler to come, the people who are destroying the city and the sanctuary, and they will set up the abomination, as we have seen in Daniel 11. You need to read everything. Also, the 70 years finish up. Jesus coming to be lifted up on the cross. Okay? To end sin. To atone for sin. Read this again, 24. Holy city. Your people and your holy city. In other words, the holy city, the end of the really holy city. To finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the holy, most holy one. You need to read everything. Everything. There is no connection between the prince that is to come in the, past, in the future and the people that destroy the city. Isn't that clear? Isn't that very clear? It's like, duh, wake up, wake up, wake up. 
How much more? You know, people, they, they, they also read the headline and then they just blabber stuff, comments. Okay. They don't even watch the whole movie. No, neither do they go to the Bible and actually study it. No, they have to put their comments down. I appreciate people that send, uh, you know, questions or real comments to what is in the Bible. I have no, you know, problems with that. Comment on what the Bible says. If you're saying, oh, this is not true, what you're thinking here. But, but that's what it says right here. If you read it, it makes sense. If you're listening to the false teachers, it doesn't make sense in your brain. Why don't you use it? So now at the end, we're going to one more thing to show very clearly that this abomination has nothing to do with the man of sin that is to come. And to show clearly that the abomination of desolation has already happened. And Jesus himself told us. Now, do you know what gospel they're going to to explain it to Matthew why Matthew because Matthew is the hardest to understand for our brains because he's not chronological he's not orderly he jumps around like Daniel and like John Oh, he's going to show you a vision right here. And then he is deciding, oh, wait a minute. I didn't tell you everything. So he has a different vision that explains in detail, more detail, what really happened here. Okay. And we don't understand it because we have a chronological mind and we think things happen chronologically. That's not the way these uh, people in the, uh, during Jesus's time or even in the Old Testament, how they thought. Okay. It's not how they did think. They didn't have that kind of mind, this chronological mind. Yes, things are there are chronological within this vision. Things are chronological, as we saw in Daniel 9, chronological. Um, Daniel 11 is chronological, but the two may overlap. Or parts of it may overlap. In Daniel 11, he showed the whole timeline of the kings all the way to the end. In 9, he only showed the 500 years from Darius the Mede to Jesus coming. So they overlap. So he, he kind of focuses in on one aspect of it. And um, Matthew is written the same way. And that's why it's very difficult to really understand Matthew. The one to go to, if you really want to know what Jesus said, about that event, the, the Matthew 24 event, is the best thing to go is to Luke. Because Luke tells you in the beginning that he is giving you an orderly fashion of what happened with Jesus. Orderly. Things in order. He describes it the best in order. Mark is okay too, but Luke is really the most orderly account of really what happened uh the, the history you know or during the time of jesus so we're going to go to luke 21 okay um do we have it or not no we still have daniel here um luke and we're going to go to 21 okay because that's the better account that's why I'm going there. So right in the beginning, we're seeing, um, and we, we don't even have to start from the beginning of 21. We're starting um, with verse 5. Okay? Verse 5, that's when the story starts. Disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones. That's where the event starts. Do you understand what the event is about? Can you read it again? It's about the temple. They're standing in front of the temple and they're bragging. Wow, look at the temple. That's really cool place, isn't it? And Jesus said, 
As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Now, do you think that is something that they want to know about? You think so? Of course. Of course they want to know about the destruction of the temple people. Okay? They're just bragging like crazy. Oh, wow, man, man, it's beautiful. God, and, and Jesus says, wait a minute, this is all going to be destroyed. So then they come to him and say, teachers say, ask, they ask, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? What did he say? Or what did they say? He says, when will that happen? What? The destruction of the temple people. And what will be the signs of it? How can we tell this is coming? Matthew is confusing. Because Matthew, for some reason, thought he had to connect that to the end times. To Jesus' second coming. And so people will misuse that to teach you the wrong thing. Because it is confusing what Matthew did. Only if you know it. And nobody ever quotes Luke 21 when they want to talk about this abomination of desolation or even this fake great uh, tribulation. Nobody. Why? Because they know, Satan knows people are more deceived by following or by quoting this Matthew that is more complicated to understand. Yep, that's why I'm going to Luke. Because Luke is orderly. He wrote things down in orderly fashion. Look, Luke chapter 1. He's writing it. He says, I'm giving you an orderly account of the things. And this is orderly. He gives you one question right there. He's not mixing it or thinking, oh, assuming, oh, that has to do with the end times. No, he's giving you right there one question. Okay. What will be the sign or what, when will that happen? And what will be the sign of the destruction of the temple? Destruction of the temple. Destruction of the temple. You want me to say it again three times? Destruction of the temple? Because that's what it means. Desolation means destruction. It doesn't mean anything else. Okay? And destruction of the temple is an abomination. Get that in your brain. So he, he replied, watch out that you are not deceived. Wow. Watch out that you are not deceived. One more time. Watch out that you're not deceived. And then he's describing the events. All the events that will happen before the destruction of the temple. Okay? Nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. Uh, they will be uh, persecuted. They will be thrown in, uh, uh, taken to the synagogues. They will be thrown into prison. All this has happened. I will put the little book on the bottom that explains that exactly. He's using Josephus' historical accounts to show you exactly what happened during that or before that time when the destruction was, uh, when the temple was destroyed. Then he says in 20, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that it is desolation is near desolation he didn't use the word abomination of desolation as here he says desolation is near but now if you understand this then you can go back to matthew and compare the two and see exactly which things you need to apply to the destruction of the temple and the signs that happened before okay then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. This has nothing to do with the future of any future event. Nothing. 
This is about the destruction of the temple. Let those in the city get out, and let those in the count in the country not enter the city. For this time, uh, for this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. Punishment. This is a uh, uh, great tribulation for the Jews. Great tribulation for the Jews. It was horrendous tribulation for the Jews. Horrendous. Okay? Read this little booklet or go to Josephus yourself. Read Josephus. He describes it in detail, the things that happen. This is what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the abomination of desolation, when he refers to Daniel and the abomination of desolation. Get it? Desolation. No place have we read so far that there is going to be a rebuilding of the fourth, uh, the third, the second temple. No third temple ever being built. Now, would you think if that a third temple was supposed to be rebuilt, God would really instructed it? People, if God wants a third temple, he would say it clearly in the word. He would not hint around. We wouldn't have to guess. We wouldn't have to assume. Clearly, in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul is talking about the body of Christ, the temple of, real temple of God. He's not t talking about a fourth temple. Never said there's going to be a, oh, I mean third temple, sorry. Third temple. Never, 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 never. There's also people that say that uh, Revelation 11, uh, you know, the uh, John was supposed to measure the temple and that's the third temple. No. John always sees the temple in heaven. Why would he then say, oh, I'm going to measure the temple on earth when he didn't even hear or saw ever a, a third temple? You know, people need to think. I know this is uh, uh, getting longer. This video is getting longer, but I have to put everything together. It's just a lot of information because I'm putting two topics together. I wanted to uh, do one just simply about the abomination of desolation. But you have to do it in connection, you know, with this temple because that's what many people believe. They believe that the abomination of, of desolation is somebody sitting in the temple. This man of lawlessness. And then, of course, they believe this man of lawlessness is the Antichrist that comes at the end sometime. So, oh, a bunch of lies. It's not biblical. Did you read anything? I did not leave anything out where it would say, hey, this and this is, you know, the third, I mean, the third, I mean, the third temple needs to be rebuilt. Well, God's instruction is for the third temple to be rebuilt. No place. If you find it, please put it on the bottom. If you ever find any reference, and it has to be that God instructed anybody to build a third temple. I have references that I can give you where God says, no, only Messiah can build the temple. And that the other temples were not really official or ordered by God. Just like the kings of Judah were not ordered by God. They forced it. They forced God's hand. Hmm, kind of hard to do, but God went along with it, of course. Same thing with building a temple. He went along with it. He didn't order it. It wasn't his idea. Why? Because he said twice in the Old Testament that only Messiah can build the temple. And you know, the Orthodox Jews today know that only Messiah can build the temple. Because that's why they haven't started yet. Because they haven't started yet, people. They have everything ready, just like David had everything ready. He was not supposed to build the temple. 
But he had everything ready for Solomon to start. And that was even a false interpretation of what God told him. He told him a descendant of yours will build the temple. And he assumed, oh, it must have been a Solomon because I want a temple right now. No place did God instruct to build a physical stone temple. No place. It was a tabernacle in the wilderness or a tabernacle in Shiloh. That was it. And it is a shadow of the things to come. Ha <laughs> ha, which I talked about in my last video. The temple, the physical temple, was only a shadow of the things to come. And the thing to come is what Jesus is building right now, his temple, his body. The body with his head on top. The temple with the Holy of Holies with him on top. And we are the holy place. Okay? If you understand that, then you will understand, understand the rest. So the abomination of desolation going back is the destruction of the temple. And again, read this little booklet. It is so good. It's called The Destruction of the Temple. Um, the Destruction. Ah. Oh, I, I cannot find it right now so fast. It's called The Destruction of the Temple um, by, I don't remember. I'll put it on the bottom. It is such an excellent little book. Such an excellent little book. Okay? If somebody does not want to uh, read Boring Josephus, The History of the Jews, that little book is just putting it together in just the best thing you can ever, you know, re read. Best information. But I'm coming to an end right now. It's really past my time. Let the Holy Spirit guide you always.